Hello and welcome to part two of this video. It's a review of the Orion Short Tube 80, and again, this video is aimed at beginners. In part one, we learned the parts of the telescope, and in part two, we're gonna take this telescope, put it on various mounts, and help you decide which one might be right for you. Let's get to it. Again, you're lucky the Orion Short Tube 80 is one of the few serious telescopes that can theoretically be used on a typical photo tripod. Now, I've got it here on an old Bogan Jr. You can put it on anything you want, but again, bigger is always better. There's almost no such thing as having too much mount for your telescope. And as a very general rule of thumb, I would say if you're going to put it on a photo tripod, try to make sure your tripod weighs in the vicinity of five pounds or greater. Again, more is always better. So you can do this and you can pan around and you can tilt. Now, it, this is called, in telescope lingo, an alt as mount. It's a short, shortened term of the phrase altitude azimuth. You don't have to know that phrase. It just means a simple mount that goes up and down and left and right. So the reason this thing isn't ideal for astronomy is if you're a photographer, you'll tend to set this thing on your camera and then you leave it alone. But in astronomy, you are constantly moving this thing. You are trying to find something, you are tracking to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. And so the quality of this motion becomes very, very important and they tend to vary. So again, a better tripod, a heavier tripod will help you out. Now here's a second type of mount and on the surface, on paper at least, it is very similar to the photo tripod. It is an altitude azimuth or alt as type mount. It has the same motions left and right and up and down. Now, what's different about this one is, so first of all, it is substantially bigger and heavier, and you're gonna see that the images aren't gonna jiggle nearly as much as with a typical photo tripod. The second thing is these axes have been calculated to be very smooth uh, for you to track this thing across the night sky. This thing even has slow motion control cables that you can use to fine tune. I don't have these installed. I tend to just use these on their own. Now, there have been several manufacturers of these things. This one is called a Vixen Porta. There have been a couple of different versions of this. There's also an Explore Scientific Twilight, and Orion also has a version of this called the Versa Go series, and there have been three versions of that one. So here's the fancy way to do it. Here's the scope again, mounted on the third type of mount. This is a German equatorial mount. Now, the German equatorial mount has the same up, down, left, right axes as the other two mount, except you'll notice one axis is tilted up in the air. The reason for this is that all of the stars in the sky appear to rotate around one point up in the sky. In the Northern Hemisphere, at that point is very near Polaris or the North Star. In the Southern Hemisphere, you don't have a South Star, you kind of got to guess. So you Southern people have a little bit more of a challenge. But it stands to reason that if we point this axis here up towards the North Star, let's pretend this is North. Now you can track the motions of the star using only one motion. So you no longer have to use two different controls to follow the stars, you only have to use one. And you can put a motor on it so it does it automatically, and in fact, this version has a computer attached to it that will find objects automatically. It has some 64,000 objects in it, some ridiculous amount of things it'll find by itself. Now, upon hearing the differences between these mounts, many beginning observers will state, I want this one. <laughs> yeah, this is the one I want. I don't want those other ones that you talked about. And that's fine if you're just gonna be aware of these two things. First of all, this is gonna cost a lot more than the photo tripod, which you may already have, or the alt as telescope specific mount, which may cost you a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, this one I think listed for around $800 when it was new, and uh, they go up from there. But anyway, equatorial mounts do come in many sizes and cost points. The simpler ones may be only a couple of hundred dollars, and the expensive ones go, you know, there doesn't seem to be any limit. The second thing I want to warn you about is that if you have an equatorial mount, you have to be willing to spend the time to use it correctly. Now with a photo tripod, you could just plunk the thing down anywhere and just start tracking. But you can't do that here. You have to take the time to point this axis towards north. And I point that out because in the observing field, I see it all the time. People buy these equatorial mounts and they point them not at the north star, but in some random direction. They just plunk the thing down. Now, if you do that, 
the mount actually works against you. It's actually harder to track things than with any other kind of mount if you don't point this thing towards the North Pole. So be sure and take the time to do that and be sure that you're willing to take the time to do that Again, there are no right or wrong answers here. Any of these mounts will work. It's just a matter of what works best for you. Okay, so one question I always get, what about photography? I wanna take pictures through the telescope. Now, my most common advice when people say this to me is don't. Wait a while. You're gonna have your hands full learning the night sky, learning how to use a telescope, learning how to see things. It's gonna take a while before you really start to master the mechanics of everything to the point where you're gonna be comfortable with photography. In fact, I often ask people to wait as long as a year before attempting any kind of photography altogether. The problem with this, nobody listens to me. <laughs> and I don't expect you to listen to me, but that's still the advice I'm gonna give you. So the most common thing to do is if you're looking at the moon is to try to get your smartphone and take a picture of the moon through the eyepiece here. I show the moon to hundreds of people each year and everybody always wants to whip out their phone and they hold it over the eyepiece and they try to snap a picture and it's very, very difficult. What you, what you need to know is the actual point of focus is actually around a fraction of a millimeter. So even if you do get the phone in exactly the right spot, by the time you hit the shutter, your, your hand will have moved a little bit and it'll be out of focus again. So the only way to do this for real if you're hand holding the camera is to keep taking the picture over and over and over again. I've had people do this 30, 40, 50 times and maybe one of them will come out and the others they just throw away. Now if you really want to do this with your smartphone, you can get a device that looks like this. This is a phone adapter and what this does is you one end of it clamps to the eyepiece like this and the other end holds the phone and there are little micro adjustments that you can make but you can get the lens of the camera right over the lens of the eyepiece and this thing will hold it still to the point where you can take the picture just be aware it can take several minutes to get that point to find that point and get it exactly the way you want it. So if you have several people looking through your telescope, bear in mind you're going to be making lots of adjustments that take several minutes apiece. Okay, let's say you want to keep going. You've taken all the pictures you want with your smartphone. Now you're ready to do it with a larger camera. So let's say you have a camera like this one. This is a Canon DSLR. Commonly what happens is you take the diagonal and the eyepiece out and you put this in it. So this is a camera body. Um, this thing here is a T-ring, this outer ring on the outside, and this is a telescope adapter. None of this stuff is expensive. You can get this online very cheaply, and then this just comes onto the camera like a lens. And if you'll notice, the end of this telescope adapter mimics the end of the eyepiece. So you just put this in here as if it were the diagonal of the eyepiece, the telescope, of course, does not know or care what's at the end. It's going to keep doing its job no matter what. So what you do is you turn this on, you focus using any method you like, and then you press the shutter and off you go. Now, again, I would advise you to wait before trying astrophotography, but for those of you who I know are not going to be listening to me, let's address this briefly. So you'll see I have this thing set up for astrophotography and I've made a few changes. I put a longer rail on here to put this auto guider on here. The reason this is here is when you're tracking long exposure photographs, this mount is no longer accurate enough. This is sort of a closed loop feedback system that issues corrective actions to the mount through a laptop. Now, experienced astronomers and photographers are looking at this and saying, Ed, why did you surround a $100 optical tube with thousands of dollars worth of imaging gear? Well, you know, that's just how I roll. So I don't know of very many people who have actually tried some serious astrophotography with this, with this particular model, so we're doing this in the name of science. But I'll throw up with some of these images that I've taken, and you can see with the moon, I mean, it looks okay. There's a little bit of softness around it. You'll probably clean that up in Photoshop if you know how. If you take deep sky images, you'll notice that the centers are sharp, but the edges are all over the place. The left side of these images are really messy and indicates that perhaps this thing is not quite parallel. Now, I should point out that all refractors 
will do this unless you have something called a field flattener, which is a device that is made especially for photography, and they don't make one in an inch and a quarter size for this telescope, so I had to go you know, sort of au naturel, so to speak. But I'll tell you something, with those deep sky images, if you were willing to crop out the distorted parts, for example, let's take a look at the uh, dumbbell nebula here. Let's crop out the parts at the edges and just show you the middle. You know, if I just showed you that, it, it's not bad. I mean, I think it's pretty good. Next to the department store telescope, astrophotography is the number one reason why people tend to drop out of this hobby. I think Murphy's Law was built for this activity. I've been taking photographs for 35 to 40 years, and I'm still discovering new and interesting ways to screw up. So hopefully I've scared you away, but if not, here's a primer to get you started. So there you have it, a really basic overview of the Orion Short Tube 80, a commonly recommended beginner telescope. Hopefully I've headed you off from going to the department store. Let me know how you made out. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.